All right, so we're gonna be posting this in our YouTube channel later on. That's why I need to record it. So all right, all right, so um everybody see my screen. Oh no, shit. Okay, screen one. Okay. Let me know if you can see my screen. Yeah, we see it. All right, so um all right, so again, um, welcome again. This is going to be our, our uh, PCM uh, strategies test, I mean, a discussion. Um, and again, this brought to you the, the Virginia chapter of NOMA. You know, we've been around since 1920, not 1920, 2020. <laughs> it's not 1920, 2020. Uh, Charter to the NOMA conference there in Oakland. Uh, here's what we're going to cover, a brief introduction, brief in stuff about the ARE. You know, um, that way, uh, in case you haven't taken the exam, you haven't taken the exam before, uh, we can um, uh, at least be familiar with it going into the exam. And then we're going to go over the PCM exam content, uh, which is those questions I sent you. And then we're going to have, um, uh, then we're going to have talk about resources. You know, the best, the best uh, methods for you to study. You know, best books. You know, the most, the best available information out there because there's a lot of stuff to study. So um that's what we're going to cover at the end and you know if we have any more questions um uh we can answer them then. again everything i'm showing you here is coming straight from the source coming straight from NCAR. i'm not you know going off you know the uh and i'm making stuff up myself even the questions were retired re questions i did not come up with those questions myself so this those came from <clears throat> uh questions that were on the, on the actual exam that were retired that you know are allowed to and Carl allows for us to share, uh, share with you. So I think everything's coming from NCARB. You know, if, I hope all of you guys have, a, have an NCARB account, so you can go in and get this information. But I'm just, you know, you know, breaking it down for you. And this, this is the two stuff that I'm using the guidelines and the handbook for all our information. All right, so let's talk about briefly about the exam. Again, the exam is offered in person at the PSI centers. You know, those are located throughout the country, and now you can do it um, online. You know, online proctoring. I never done the online proctoring myself. You know, I heard some people like it, some people don't like it, but you know, you have to have a lot of things in place in order to have the online proctoring that like your computer has to, you know, have certain features in it and you know, all this stuff. And then they're still gonna monitor you while you take the exam, right? So, uh, and that came about from COVID, right? But now, you know, most, you know, COVID restrictions have been lifted so you can go back to, uh, there used to be the Prometric Center, now they switch to PSI, which is another testing uh, center, uh, and they're located throughout. There's probably one near you if you haven't taken it. So the exam costs $235, you know, per division. And like I said, you can take, uh, if you fail, if you take this exam and you fail it, you can take it again in 60 days. Uh, however, you can only take it three times within a 12-month calendar period. So if you fail it, you can take it again in 60 days. You fill it again, you can take it in 60 days, but then after you fill it that time, you have to wait uh, 12 months from the first time you took it. And the first time, first time you fail, if you fail it again. So that's kind of like the rule before, you had to wait six months to take the exam, but but now they uh, they let you take it 60 days, because I think six months was ridiculous to wait. Uh, so everybody was complaining about that, so they moved to the 60 days, but you still, but they put that three times away, you're not memorizing the test, and they give, they give them a chance to re refresh the questions. All right, and of course, once you pass a division, it's valid for five years, right? So if you if you start taking exams, uh, and then five years come up, you know you, the first test that you pass it goes away, and then subsequently the next one will will be will be uh, will be uh, uh, go away until you pass all of them. So you have five years to pass all of them before you start losing the first the first one. And with COVID, they gave us a little bit of now they have they have exceptions. You can and you and you can uh, you can ask Ankar for those. For example, if you know ladies, if you get pregnant, you know um, that's obviously a, a reasonable excuse to get an extension. So they will give you an extension for that. If, if there's like a some crazy situation, and like losing your job is typically not one of them. Like if you say you lost your job and you didn't have any money to, you know, they're not going to probably do it. But you know, if you have like a death in the family or you or you were hospitalized for a period of time, obviously, you know, you're in the hospital, you can't be thinking about exams. Or a family member that you you a caregiver, a child, or something like that's in the hospital for a century period of time, they will give you an extension, you know, depending on, on the circumstances. So, so the, there are some uh, circumstances where they can give you an extension on your on this five year 
but you losing your job or you not feeling like taking an exam or you fail an exam or you've been frustrated, it's not one of them. So that's not that's not gonna fly with them. All right, so any questions on that? The general stuff about the exam. All right, so moving on. So I'm pretty sure you're all familiar with the types of questions, the type of items, they call them items, not questions anymore. Items on the test. You got your multiple choice, which is what the sample is gonna be mostly composed of. That you typically, you know, four choices. And then you got the check all that apply, which is more than one choice. And like I said, every question in the exam is worth one point, right? So nothing is, is weighted. You're not going to get more credit for more difficult questions. They don't go in order of, of like the SAT of easiest to hardest. It's not like that. All the questions are all the same. Some questions are easier than others, but they're all worth one point. So if you don't have, if you don't get a question, you don't understand it, you can mark it and come back to it later, but don't, you know, say you have a, you have a time exam, so you don't want to be spending too much time on one question that's worth one point and miss out on more questions because of that, right? So you got quantitative. So every time you have to type in a question, it's going to be a numeric, a uh, numeric, a uh, 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 numeric uh, form, right? They're not going to ask you to spell something where you have to type it. So every time you have to fill in the blank, it'll be a quantitative, like, you know, you know, and I suggest, you use decimals, not not try to do fractions, right? So then, you know, two point two or you know five point five point five instead of five and a half, right? Don't try to put that one with the, don't do that. I mean, even though I think the exam um, takes it, but you know, I, I would suggest you, you stick to uh, decimals. Hot spots where you pick a spot and you, you know they tell you find the weep hole in this wall section, and you you know you and you you move your cursor to it, you pick it. And the exam, the general area, if you put in the general area where they want you to, it's gonna be correct. And obviously drag and place where they might give you like a wall sections and you got a, a list, a bank of the right answers, you drag them to the right leaders. That's kind of like the, the drag and place. So that's the type, of, the type of items that you're gonna see on the test, on this exam. All right, the exam content. Again, what is the uh, practice management about? Uh, so from them, this is coming straight from NCAR, right? So this division will assess objectives related to the management of architectural practice, including professional ethics, fiduciary responsibilities, and the regulation go uh, governing the practice of architecture, right? So it will focus on issues related to pre-contract tasks, including negotiation, human resources, and consultant development, right? So again, it's, it's, it's this, this is not really about the, the, the traditional architecture you know, uh, the construction details and stuff like that, but it's about the practice of architecture, the business side of it, right? And the old exams, the 4.0 exams before we came 5.0, we didn't have a, a, a practice management exam or product management. It was kind of like those questions were like kind of sprinkled in in the other tests, but it wasn't a strictly um, practice management uh, management side of it. And then on this exam, they decided to include that because that's important. As architects, we need to understand the, the business side of architecture and the management side of it, right? Unfortunately, a lot of people that take the exam are in the early age of their careers where they're not doing any of that, right? You're just doing construction documents or whatever. You're not doing a lot of your, your boss, your principal is the one getting the projects and doing all the CA and doing all that. So it's imperative that you that you ask your firm or your boss to get you some, some well, you have to do it for the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, hours that you have to submit, right? Uh, uh, so uh, your 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 experience. So it's important that you that you actually try to get some some of that experience in the way this stuff is not completely unfamiliar to you and you're not reading everything from the book. I mean, everything's going to come from up from the books, but it's good that you actually have some practical knowledge of it, right? So see if you can get your 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 principal to do that or your boss. So uh, how many items? You got. 65 total items on this exam, right? One of the shorter ones, 65. Your appointment time is three hours and 20 minutes. Uh, you have a break of 30 minutes. Um, the, the items that are gonna be a score is 59, right? So they're not gonna score you in 65 because six of them, so six of them are kind of practice items that anchor throws in there to see how people, how people, how people do uh, on them. And then if they see that people do well and they add them to the test, if not, they eliminate them. But the thing is that you won't know which which the practice questions are. So your best answer, your best bet is to try to get all sixty five, or do as best as you can all sixty five because you're not going to know which of those six are not score. So, but they're only going to score fifty nine of them. This exam has a pretty high passing rate. I think it's in the sixty percent percentile. 
uh, you know, which is one of the highest ones. You know, uh, I think PD, uh, PPD has one of the lowest ones, like in the high 40s, 49, 50%. So this one, and practice and, and practice um, practice management and, and product management have one of the highest um, passing rates uh, of this exam. So people, people, a lot of people, most people that take the exam pass it the first time or the second time, as opposed to the bigger, the other bigger, more more elaborate exams. So that's one, that's one good thing. And then you're gonna have ten to fourteen case study case case study questions on this exam. So. Um, it's up to you when you want to take your break before your break was, was given to you, but now you can choose when you take a break, 30 minutes and go out. If you're in the test center, go out and come back and you can resume your exam, uh, uh, before the 30 minutes. If you wait more than 30 minutes, the exam is going to automatically start, you know, so you have to make sure you give yourself some time because if you've ever been to the testing center, they have to, it's harder to get into the white house, right? You have, they have to you know, uh, scan you and check your ID to make sure you're not bringing, you know, you're not cheating. So you got to give yourself some time to um, give yourself some time for uh, to go in and come back. Any questions on the on the actual exam? Yes. I'm going out on the balcony. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody have a question? All right. So. Um, so, okay, so here's the breakdown of the different sections of the exam. There's kind of four different sections in the exam. Uh, business operations, uh, which is 20 to 26%. Um, finance is raised from development of practice. You know, practice by delivery of service, services, and then practice methodology. So the biggest section is section two, it is between 29 and 35%. And then the third largest is this section three, which is 20, uh, 20 to 20. So these, these are fairly close. Like the other bigger exams, like PDD and PPD, they have like a big gap between, you know, I think two of the two of the four sessions contain most of the questions. The other ones are like under 10%. But this exam is more evenly distributed. So you're gonna get a lot of questions from all the sections, uh, you know, relatively close. So um you don't have to spend so you pretty much you have to study everything, right? So you don't have to spend the majority of the time on on one on one or two sections. Which you know, it's kind of you know. So you look at the sections: finances, race, and development of practice. So like when you're studying, you gotta make sure that you that you're covering those areas. That's kind of what they give you. What the kind of like the session or breakdown of, of the exam, you know. Which you know, it could be a little vague a little bit because typically you just study everything. You don't think about sections and stuff. Uh, and you see that when you get your your scoring report, that's kind of how they break it down. Uh, but you know, just to let you know, kind of where you need to study more, but. If you pass it the first time, you, you won't have to worry about that. Again, these are the same sections again, and kind of tells you um, what each one of those does. Uh, business operation, you know, pretty self explanatory you know, understand the running of a business, finances, you know, uh, this session is about running and developing a, a practice, re, uh, re, uh, paying attention to finances and risk, liabilities, negotiating contracts, all that fun stuff that we never learn in school, right? That we have to go out and learn on our own as a business owner. Yeah, that, that applies to architecture or any other business. You have to do this, these things, not just architecture. Now, this, this is the stuff that's kind of relates to architecture more, practice why the liberal services, you know, where you have to, you know, assess the, the you know, the context of the, of the overall impact of running a practice. And this one right here, the practice methodology is kind of basically how you're going to approach your project, right? How you're going to attack it, different ways of doing it. You know, so, Again, it's just general business sense stuff that applies not only to architecture, but like any business that you have, right? Uh, you have to do all these things in order to have a successful business. And that's kind of like why this was included in the, on the exam, because again, architects, we're not known for being, um, well, we don't study business in school. You know, a lot of good architects that, have, uh, that run good firms, they you know, have a business background and it's a lot easier on them because they understand the business side of it. Any questions on that? All right, we're doing good on time. So we're gonna get into the questions now. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, like I said, I'm gonna read the question and then go over the, over the choices and give you the answer and tell you what the answer is that. And then, then if you have a question there, we can, we can have a discussion uh, open. So, all right, let's get into it. So question number one, in developing a list of bidders, and this is on a traditional, um, traditional um, design bit, design, um, 
the sign bit bill, right? This is what we're talking about here. Not like not in a um, not in a uh, uh, fast track or design bill. No, that's this traditional, right? And in, 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 this is what we're talking about. So, uh, in developing a list of bidders for a private project, the architect's role is, and that's it. This is the design bit bill, you know, uh, method. A select the contractor. B recommend qualified contractors, and this to uh, this is for the owner. So it's like what the architect role is to the owner, right? Because that's who the, that's who hires the architect. Uh, run the contract is in order of presence, and D discourage owner recommended contractor. So let's look at some of these choices here. So, so you develop a list of bidders for a project project. So it's not public, right? So you don't have to be advertised. Typically, pro public projects not typically old pro project. Uh, projects, you know, building that, that school or building that um, that library or building a road, you know, whatever it is, which is comes from private funds, the all that has to be publicly bid, right? So they typically go with the lowest bidder. That's typically how, how it works because you're spending taxpayers' money and you definitely don't want to, you know, to, in order to avoid fraud, in order to avoid the, the, the best interest of the public, they typically go, most of the time, go with the, with the lowest bidder. That's on a public project, right? And they have to advertise it via, back in the day, it was in newspapers. You uh, know, now they advertise it in various ways. They have they have those um, those uh, those websites that that contractors can go and, and and bid on stuff, and that's where they advertise it. And some contractors pay a fee to get access to a lot of these bits, public bits. You know, so that's that's how that works. But when it's a project project, you know, when you're working for one uh, one owner or it doesn't have to be one owner. Uh, if the money is not being tied to the public, then it's different, right? So you can, as the owner, they, they don't have to publicly advertise. They don't have to go with the lowest bidder, bidder either. They can go, they can pick whatever contractor they want. So the, it's the, it's the architect is written in the contract that, that the architect is to assist with that. So A, the architect is not going to let the contractor because A, the architect is not, is not paying for it, right? So you're not paying for the, for the project, so you're not going to tell the owner. You're not going to set the contract for the owner. Uh, C, rent the contract in order of preference. That really doesn't that really doesn't work. You're not going to rank the contractors like that. And then D, you're going to discourage owner recommended contractors. Again, you're not the owner. You're not paying for it. So the the owner is the one forking the money. The money. So you shouldn't be discouraging the owner on stuff. So what you what you can do is is the right answer is B. Which is recommend a qualified contractor. So you basically, let's say you're building a an office building, you know, the owner might not have, not might not be familiar with the contractors in the area, or might be their first project, or you know. So you can recommend, you can assist the owner in finding qualified contractors who have experience designing buildings. I mean, that type of office buildings. You don't want to get a contractor who's all they do is, you know, medical offices or or um, schools or whatnot. You probably want to get somebody who's, I mean, you know, some contracts typically do a variety of projects, but you want to get contractors who have a good reputation, uh, are known for their quality of work, and that can do the job, right? So typically you want, so that's typically you want to get four or five, you know, the way they can submit bits. And then the contractor can you can assist the the the, the owner in reviewing the bits because the owner might not be familiar with what they're looking at. Uh and then um and the owner can decide based on the price, you know, solely, you know, they will have all the all the qualifications that they need. Um, they can decide based on the price or based on on who they like, or you know, you can conduct interviews, whatever you want to do. And then they basically can um select the contractor that way. Uh, and then it's up to the owner. Where it's a public, it's different. Uh yes, ma'am, you have a question, Monica? I do um it's it's not related to these studies. It's, it's about so for example that let's say that you have like a list of like the beats, right? Like the beats come in. Um and mm -hmm. let's say that they're the owner, so they're too high and the owner decides to redesign. Right. So we as architects, are we obligated to redesign for free or should we charge a fee for the redesign? Yes, yeah, so depends on the contract, but according to the AIA contracts, you're supposed to assist the contractor without pay, without uh, charging an additional yeah, fee right. to get to get uh, to get to basically re, re uh, resend the prior for bidding. So if all the bids come too high 
and the architect and the owner is like, I can't afford any of the only any of these, then you are to help the contractor either through I mean the contractor, the owner would be a mm-hmm. value engineering. That means taking things out of the building to lower the price. You know, like if you want to have that Italian marble, maybe you want to go with you know locally, mm-hmm. local available marble, you know, uh, tiles instead of having you know, things like that, you know, you don't want, you want that fancy chandelier in there, maybe you want to go with something that, so, you know, you can help the, the, the and that's typically done without uh, the additional fee uh, per the AI contracts. Now, you can have a different contract where you, where you can modify that and you can work that out with the owner and say, yeah, I'm going to charge you if we, if you expect that the bills are going to be too high because the owner is being stubborn because, you know, they, he or she wants all this stuff, then you can be like, well, I know this stuff is going to give value engineers, so I'm going to put that stipulation in the contract to change that. But typically, that's not the case. You typically, the, the architect is giving the owner um, estimates, you know, throughout uh, each phase, even though, again, us architects are not good at that, uh, but some of us are, you know, so you can, uh, you can, as you can, I said, the owner can bring additional estimators as, as they go along the project that way when the stuff is big, it's kind of close to what you expect. But because we're giving estimates, we kind of tell them, hey, we, we think the price is going to cost X. So if the project comes way higher than X, then we have to kind of kind of fix our, our boo-boos there, kind of like try to help it fix. That's typically yeah. how it is. And it will not change if it's like a private project or a public project. We'll still afford well, if, if it's a project, yeah, if, if it, yeah, it will not change. If it's a public project, it's even more, it's even worse uh, because mm-hmm. then you yeah. deal with taxpayers' money, and then you typically have to go to like the city council or whoever the mayor to get more money. So you don't want to do that. So you're definitely going to value engineer the heck out of it, you know. And, you know, and that, that's typically, like I said, I work in a lot of project. Uh, public projects and those are typically they typically have their own estimators and you know early away those numbers are very close to what you know to what uh to what has been estimated when it comes to bidding because like i said you're dealing with public money and then to get that those those funding you have to go through more channels to get additional funding uh and then if you can do that and value engineer that takes that takes longer when she lays the project when she lays that that nice library for being open or that public school for being open and it gets delayed, people get mad and that people lose their, people lose their, uh, their, don't get reelected. <laughs> so that, you know, Perfect. so. Thank you. All right. So number two, uh, geotechnical observation reports are usually paid by A, the structure engineer, B, contractor, C, architect, D, owner. And that should be, that should be pretty straightforward. The owner paid for the geotechnical report. And typically that's done before you even begin drawing. So that's kind of, kind of like, you know, the owner has to have a survey, you know, already. And they typically, now you can do that for the owner if you want, you know, but again, they will pay for it. You will include that in your fee and you will, you know, he will pay it through you. But typically it's good when they have all that stuff. I was recently just got done doing a, a project for a friend of mine. You know, he wanted me to, he wants to do an extension to his house. And I'm like, you got to get that geotechnical report. And I even, I recommended a few and he hired one and, and he paid for it. And he gave it to me for me to finish, you know, how to do my footings and stuff. So that's something that Sammy just happened to me the other day. So that's typically paid by the, by the owner. All right. Any questions on that? So stuff like that, like surveys, um, you know, your technical reports, you know, programming, that's not part of the, the traditional services architects uh, have. You know, that's additional, you know, so. All right, so well, number three. Sorry, question on that. Is what would mm-hmm. not be paid by the owner? Because I assume that they're basically, even if it's not directly paying for everything. Uh, who's, who's asking that question? I'm trying to see who's asking the uh, Sorry. Oh, well, so, I mean, so the, the, the owner, I mean, the owner's paying for everything. Right, the owner is basically paying for it, but there's some things that the owner has to have that that typically the owner has to has to have beforehand before they even come to you, right? So in order for you to do your work, you have to have a survey of the property, right? So it's it's, it's good practice for the for the uh, for the owner to have a, a a survey of the property already. That way, they can just hand that to you and you can get to work. And then geotechnical report, you know, that that typically comes with recommendations for footings and stuff like that. Now, the, the, the owner might not be familiar with that. You know, they might be like, well, I know how to do that. 
So you as an architect, like I just said in my project, we'll, we'll have to direct them to a geotechnical engineer, like, hey, go talk to so-and-so and so and have them, you know, hire them because I worked with them before. You can recommend it or they can go and find their own and they can show up to the site and do a geotechnical report and they can give that to you before you start your work. Right. You know, but but like I said, the owner will pay for everything because through your fees and all that stuff, it's just, you know, included in the contract that, you know, you will pay your consultants, but the owner will pay you for that. But this is stuff that has to, has to be done before you even begin uh, begin the, the project. Yeah. Uh, can I step in? Yeah. Um, it's so you can look this up in the arch owner architect agreement, which is B101. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and it'll tell you what are um, things the owner that is on um, the owner side and what the architect is liable for. Um, and I've been studying for this, so it's kind of fresh in my memory. One thing that um, um, one point that was made was anything that has to do with the land is the owner's um, requirement. So the owner has to pay for it. So that's where the geotechnical report comes in. Um, right. And then anything else that has to do with the building, that's where the architect, that's where the architect fees come in. So that's where it's the structural engineer, the civil engineer. Now the civil engineer is weird. That is on the architect side, the civil engineer, MEP and structural, those are in lighting, anything to do with architects, consultants, those are architects, but that's also in the B101 um, owner architects agreement as well. Yeah, you gotta study those. I'm gonna get to that in a little bit too. Uh, those those are essential for this pro for these two exams. It's studying the uh, the A201, the B101, and uh, the A201, right? So those are you know the the general general conditions, the architect owner agreement, and then you got the the art the owner contractor agreement, right? So and then the A201 kind of gives general directions for both of those. Again, those contracts can be amended. I mean, you don't have to use the AIA contracts at all, but for this exam, they're going to use the AIA contract. So that's what that's what. So if if your firm you didn't use that, or you never used them before, and you used to doing your own contracts, forget about that stuff. You're going to have to kind of like what Brian said. You're going to have to study those AIA contracts. So that's what the exam is going to use, right? So, um, like I said, but in reality, the, those could be amended to you know, to you, so you can do what, whichever. But the, the they're going to go with with the traditional uh, traditional uh, contracts. Uh, not traditional, but typical contracts that AI provides, just just, a, just to keep it uh, typical for everyone. All right. Any more questions on that? All right. So, okay. So, number three. So, according to the Architect's Handbook of Professional Practice, which is a book that you're going to definitely need to rely on, study for this exam, um, a project manager's first key challenge is so, this is the first key challenge A, to meet profitability, B, meet contractual obligations, C, Clearly identify the client's expectations and de match the team's members' judgment and creativity. So initially, I thought it would be B, which is kind of make contractual ob obligations. Because obviously, you had to, you know, it's in the contract, so you have to follow and meet those 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 contractual obligations. But actually, this is going this is stepping a little bit above that. Kind of like in, as a general rule, you know, the right answer will be C, is to clearly identify what the client is expecting of you. That's kind of like the challenge. So the, the client has a set of expectations. And that will kind of like uh, kind of determine how the, the entire project will move forward, right? Because the client is expecting something as you and you as a professional have to either come, come close or deliver closely to those expectations. And that's how the, the projects can, can run smoothly and without any issues. Uh, because if you, if you don't, that's when issues arise and that's what other things. So that's kind of the number one key. And everything else is follows, follows uh, clearly along with that. Uh, anybody have a question? That Monica, you have a question? I do. Um, I did select uh, C. I was just wondering why wouldn't it be A? I mean, from my point of view, it's like meeting profitability. Profitability goal would be more like an internal goal, like within the firm of a project manager. Um, but I don't know. I would like to know your thoughts. Why well, not A? Well, that's definitely that's 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 for your own. That's kind of your own personal. This is kind of yeah. going to you and the client, between you and the mm -hmm. client, between you and your uh and your and who's hiring you. So yes, you definitely want to be you want to make a profit. Obviously, that that's that's kind of like how you stay in business. However, like I said, as a, as an ethical, uh, rational way of thinking, it you are working for somebody else. And you want to make sure you meet their expectations because if you do, then they're going to hire you again, and that's where more profit will come in. Because sometimes you're going to have to take a loss. 
you know, you, like for example, like when you, um, you know, if the bids come too high and you had to value engineer all that stuff and you're not charging the owner, that's a loss on your, on your, on your side. So you want to make sure that you are, uh, are, uh, are, are giving estimates as closely as you can to the actual, you know, what you think the bid is going to be, you know, so that's, you know, because you don't want to take that loss, right. You, you know, so that's kind of, so if you're trying to, you know, be profitable, you know, you're going to say, screw it. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to uh, revise this drawing without charging, you know, because I'm trying to make some money here. But the card is saying that you're going to have to take an L on that, <laughs> on that particular thing. That's kind of just one, one scenario. Like I said, that's kind of like the, the, the key challenge. And, that, and, and uh, that's another thing. You have to look at what the question is asking you, right? First key challenge, that means you, you're dealing with the client, you're dealing with, with the project itself. And like I said, all these could be technically right, but sometimes it's not, it's not, the, it's not, it's, it's the best answer, not the right answer, right? Because I think all these are kind of right, you know, in their own way, but you have to pick the best answer and the best answer is C. And those are the questions you have to watch out, the questions you have to watch out in the exam, because you're going to get a lot of questions that I'm like, oh my goodness, three of these could be right. And I'm not sure which one it is. And you have to closely look at what they're asking you, because we, we architects tend to overthink things and think to, you know, tend to, um, you know, be as close as we can to the answer, where sometimes the answer is just right there in the question, or you we're missing what the question is asking, and that's what we kind of like lose lose track of stuff. All right, we're gonna pick it up a little bit here. It's, uh, uh, okay, so number four, in order in order to provide the most effective coordination of the engineering consultant's work during the construction documents phase of the work, the architect should. Um, and I'm just gonna tell you that the answer is the answer is C. Right. Especially now in you know, the whole regular weekly or monthly meetings. Now, you know, with the advent of virtual meetings, it's a lot, e a lot easier. You know, back in the day, you know, before the advent of Zoom and Teams, you had to have to drive somewhere or, you know, or have a phone call, have like a conference call. But then you can share streams. Right. You just were, were just talking. Uh, so that's that's what typically was a good idea to have your consultants like in the city or near you, that way you could drive to the office, or you could drive to your office or what now you can roll out the drawings and talk. But these days now you can be anywhere because you know we got we can share screens and we can look at stuff together and you know and and it's all good. So in, in order to you know to, to have the most effective coordination, you want to be having those 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 weekly or monthly meetings depending on the type of work, you know, that way you can talk about progress and how can you revise the drawings accordingly, right? So like these set memos of telephone conversations as needed, that's that's not effective at all, right? Uh, you can, you don't wanna call in here every day, they're gonna get annoyed, right? You don't wanna be calling your consultant every single day to ask them a progress, that's gonna be, you know, and then maybe the consultant at the beginning and at the end, yeah, you're gonna miss a lot, <laughs> you know, big period there. Nothing's gonna, everything's gonna be completely whack if you do that. Any questions on that one? That one's a straightforward. All right, number five, which of the following is the most important consideration when the architect owner is negotiating, when the architect, Architect owner contract is negotiated, right? So this is you and the and the architect, uh, uh, well, the, the owner and the architect. You know, according to this, you know, client background checks, okay, ties of consultants, construction delivery period method. That's very important, right? Because that's that's, but that 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 has to do with costs, not with the you know the, the, the negotiation between you and the and the owner. So the answer is D, right? The scope of services. Uh, what is what does the client what does the client want? You know what am I going to do for you? You know what am I designing? What are, what are your expectations? Am I going to have to have a, sometimes as an architect you have to meet with the you, if you're working on a historic site you have to provide drawings or renderings and you have to go before the the historic board and the owner is asking you to do that right? So you know a couple services you know you know sometimes you have a straight straight, you know, straight project, you know, the, own, the owner owns land somewhere and he just wants you to build this and you build it and that's it. And you do some traditional services, you know, but then sometimes there are other services that all the, the owner wants you to do, wants you to do help him with programming because he or she does not know how to, you know, how to program a certain building. So you assist them with that. So that's the additional cost outside of the basic services, you know, outside of the uh, schematic, uh, design development and uh, concession documents, right? These are your, uh, your, your typical services. So, you know, so the scope of services will determine how many hours you can assign, how many, how many people you need on the project, you know, all that stuff. So that's the number one thing. Uh, when you negotiate a contract, um, you know, what is, uh, what is, this, what is it that the client wants and what's going to be involved that way 
And that will determine your fee. That will determine how many people you need to put on the job, how many times, how long it's going to take uh, to, to complete, uh, all that stuff. So a couple of services is the most important thing. Consultants, all that stuff, you know, comes later. You know, once you determine the scope of services, you know what, you know, you know what consultants you're going to need, right? If you need like a, if they're designing some theater or some high tech stuff, you're probably going to have to get a audio visual consultant or a, or a, a sound consultant, you know, that, you know, because you know, you don't have any expertise on that. So all that stuff will be determined by the scope of services. All right. Any questions on that? Like I have, I have it as project delivery method, but is there a different delivery method for construction? Would that be like a cost like DMP and cost? Yes, delivery method. So delivery method after you, I mean, so let's say you determine the scope of services, right? So you know exactly what type of building it is. Then the, the owner, the, then you as the owner, um, you um, can determine what the delivery method is. You can do a traditional design bit build where you design it. You know, you go to the progress of designing it, and uh, and the owner pays you. Then the owner hires a contractor. You bid it, and you build it. Or you can do design build, where the owner say, "Well, I, I have a contractor in mind." You know, so the contract you go, to, he goes, he or she goes to the contractor, and the contractor hires the architect because he's thinking about costs. He wants to know how much the stuff is going to cost right away. The the, uh, the contractor is going to tell, you, "Okay, it's going to cost x x amount of money," and you're going to stick to that budget. So that means as, as an owner. You're gonna to have to take, you know, cut some things out because you know you, and then or you can do fast track where you want this thing to get built quickly. You know, um, uh, and you can or you can do uh, uh, design bit build with a construction manager that way you know cost. So all that stuff again is going to be determined by the scope of services. You know, and that typically the the, the type of of delivery is typically determined by a cost and b how fast the project is needed. You know, a lot of people are, these days uh, are doing well. Not these days, but if you go to like rural areas, you have people doing a lot more design build where they go to a contractor and the contractor, it's one phone call. So the contractor does, is done, is doing everything, you know, but are the owner is kind of giving his, he, he, uh, her or his rights to kind of have more input on the design because the design is, is being more cost driven than actual aesthetically driven, you know. So one phone call, and then you know, as opposed to having design bit bill, where you have a, a owner has a contract with the contractor and a contract with the architect, and if the contract, the owner has a, uh, a, a issue with the with the contract, he has to channel that to the architect, and that just takes longer, and you know, so that's just just depends on what you want to do. All right, all right, cool. Number six, to resolve contractual, and that's kind of brings brings us to this question here. To resolve contractual disputes with clients, an architect should, and again, this is on a design bit bill, you know, uh, type of delivery, design bit bill. Uh, well, I mean, you could do it, I guess, on design bill, but this is more talking about the traditional. So <clears throat> to, in order to resolve contractual disputes, which is all in the A201 uh, uh, documents, uh, you can re, uh, resign the contract, refund the fees, amend the contract, or consider mediation, right? So according to the contracts, the first thing you should do is you know, the first one you should consider is D, consider medi mediation. That means you go to uh, a mediator, right? A third party mediator. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of mediators out there who are certified, your state, they have to be certified, whatnot. And they have the authority to kind of look at uh, both sides, right? There's a, there's a dispute between uh, the contractor and the and the and the um, and the and the owner. Oh, the architect and the and the, and the and the owner, right? It doesn't matter which one. The the documents say you should go to a mediator first, and then see the mediator can can resolve. And you both agree that you're going to that you that you're going to uh, follow whatever the mediator says. Now you can say, you know, I don't want to, you know, that we don't want to do the mediation. We're going to do well, I'm just going to sue you. Litigation, right? That's going to be more costly. That's going to take more time. So a lot of times you don't want to be doing be going because that's going to cost more. It's going to take more time, and then who knows what the courts might decide, right? Typically, when you when you start, then you have to hire lawyers. So it gets really messy and complicated, right? Um, uh, so you typically just want to try to consider mediation first, or you can just fire the person. You can fire the architect, you can fire the contractor, right? So you can resign the contract. You just pay them, but you can just go away. That happens quite a bit. Like you know, you as an architect get fired. Okay, that's fine. You're firing me. You can just make sure you pay me for everything I've done for you, right? 
Because if you don't, then we're going to go back again, back to litigation, back to mediation. Actually, that's not even mediation. It's going to be litigation because they're going to sue you, right? And the same thing with the contractor. You know, so you can, you can, uh, you're can you not going to refund the fees. That's never going to happen. You can technically amend the contract. <clears throat> but again, that can come to mediation as well. Um, but like, the first thing you should do to solve disputes is consider mediation, uh, where you have a mediator. Uh, and then, or arbitrator, or whatever you know, some nice arbitration. It's called arbitration. And then you have that person. The person has the authority to look at the cases carefully and decide which one is, you know, in, inside with one particular party. And that should be your first option because it's fastest, it's the cheapest, and it's the most effective one as opposed to going to court, hiring lawyers, and spending too much time, you know, dealing with that. Trust me, I've, I've seen, I, I've been to lunch and learns where um, we have. Uh, I'm pretty sure you guys all have, you know, lawyers that represent uh, uh, represent uh, construction companies and architects, and those guys tell you how messy this stuff can get. And that's what they do. There's some lawyers that just represent, that just work for the construction industry, and that's all they do, you know, because when it gets uh, uh, to uh, litigation, then they get hired in and it just costs a lot more money to both parties, right? So any questions on that? Mediation is uh, what they call by 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 time and arbitration and our, uh, arbitration and litigation are not fighting. So yeah, litigation is when litigation is when you go to court. Mm -hmm. You know, mediation is kind of like. Binding. What was that? Sorry, arbitration is binding. Mediation is not. Exactly. So I so me leave it out. So. Uh, mediation is that if one of the parties don't agree, they can escalate it to the next level. Or like that's that's non binding. Yeah. Arbitration, yeah, you have a judge that decides for you. And and that decision is Yeah, you go into decision. yeah, you go into courts and yeah, it's final. Like I say, it's more messy than than the um I said mediation is just the easiest one. Um, but I say you can you can do arbitration and you can go to litigation. It's just the more you the more you take it in, the more time it takes and the messier it gets. All right. Uh, so seven. Which of the following is the most frequently used method of estimating construction costs when programming is completed? It's completed. So these are the very early stages, right? When you are doing basically schematic design and you want to provide uh, the the owner with a basic cost. Of how much, and 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 the answer is is a unit area cost. And basically, there's several books. You know, there's the RS Means um, that can kind of give you. I don't know if you guys have ever used the RS Means uh, books of uh, of um, of estimating. You know, you can basically give you know uh, the the owner a square you know a square a cost per square foot. You know, it's going to cost forty five dollars per square foot or whatever. I don't know, just throwing a number. And then they can kind of see. So if you're designing a bank or you're designing an office building, you can go to the RS means and you can find out where it is in the country and the type of materials and all this stuff. And you can basically give the owner a basic estimate of how much it's going to cost based on the square footage. And that's, like I said, very early. Again, as you start programming the building, that's after you get the, based on the program, you know, how many square feet is going to be in the room, the, type, the types of this type of space is going to be in the room and the, and the size. So that's kind of early. So you, you, we're not talking about materials here. We're not talking about type of construction. We're not talking about, you know, if you're going to have elevators and all this other, all this other stuff comes later. Like I say, as, as the program gets more detail, then you can start giving more, more detail, uh, more detail uh, estimates. And now these are those types of and estimates, like capitalization ratio, we don't use that. Construction loan value, we don't use that. So it's kind of like, they kind of give you the answer because the unit area cost is kind of the only one that kind of relates to us to architecture. Because well, the contractor estimate, but that's a contractor. So if you bring a contractor in, you know, like I say, if you do the design build method, uh, the a contractor can give you an estimate. It's going to be way accurate, especially if they've done it before. So that contractor has done that. I'm just going to be as simple as possible, like a residential townhome. If that contractor, all that, all that the contractor does is residential townhomes in X city. And you go to the contractors, hey, how much does it cost to build me to get one built just like that one? Yeah, the contractor's gonna tell you, yeah, it's gonna cost this much because that's how much that one cost me. So that's straight up, right? That's as, as, as simple as it can get. But then if they go to an architect, the architect's gonna be like, well, I mean, I never done a townhome. I never, you know, so I need to do some research and find out how much 
basically the, the architect can consult a contractor be like hey i know you typically build townhomes how much you know roughly these guys cost per square foot and the contractor can tell you and you can pass information to the owner and that's going to be fairly accurate you know so it just depends on, on the type of building and yeah, so the more familiar you are with the building if you're as an architect you have done that type of project before you're probably going to have a very close uh, knowledge of how much it costs based on the previous project you did if it was recent. Right? If it was like 10 years ago, then it's, it's a whole different ballgame. But if you recently, I said, just keeping it simple, if you're a residential architect and somebody comes to you, they want to build a home and you know you've done a home very similar to that one, you can kind of tell them how much it costs from the previous project. You know, it might be a little bit more, a little bit less, depending on the one, but you kind of are familiar with it. So, but the unit area cost is the one that's the, at the very beginning, uh, the one that you will use uh, based on basic, basically the, the square footage. All right, we got three more in 10 minutes. According to standard owner architect agreements, a presentation model for a client's promotional use is, is it a standard service? No. I mean, it's a, it's, it's, so the answer is C. Um, I'm sorry, uh, what am I looking at? So yeah, the answer is C, not a basic service. Again, if, you, if, the, client if the client is requiring you to build a model of whatever said project, which you know, people don't even do anymore, but if they do, you typically as an architect, they're gonna do, do the model yourself in your office. You're probably gonna hire somebody that does model making and they will do the model. So that's an additional fee. So you have to put that in, in, the, in the contract as a, as a non-basic fee. So that's an additional fee that costs, that, that, you know, an additional cost uh, apart from the, 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 the schematic design, design development, uh, and construction documents, right, that you're going to do. Uh, you know, the schematic design, the, uh, the, the DD and all the uh, CDs and all that. That's not, that's not part of the basic services, right, which is in the contract. So this is an, it will be an addition to it. Right, so anything like that, like if you had to go present that to the the historic board, you had to do presentations, you had to travel for that, you know, all that stuff that's not there, that's additional, it's not a basic service. So that's uh, uh that's that's what that is. All right, any questions on that one? I want to stay forward. Uh, so like I say, if you had to do anything like you, that you had to do in school, like models, all that stuff that we had to do in school, you know, presentations, models, all that stuff is extra. We, you know, all that stuff is typically get extra, you know, uh, models and get in front of a couple of professors to present your project. You know, like you have to do that in front of the city council. All that stuff is extra additional services that are not part of your basic service. All right. So you think about it that way. All right. So this one is a multiple answer one here. So which of the following should be included in the rain contract for the architectural services? Check the truth that applies. So these are, in my opinion, the hardest questions on the exam. Because you have to get all the all the answers correct in order to get one point, and they even make it more difficult when they tell you. So right here they tell you it's three, right? So you know you're gonna have three answers. But when they tell you check all that apply, you have no idea. It could be one, it could be two, it could be three, it could be four. Those are even those are the hardest ones because you like okay check all that apply. Okay, I have no idea how many. Typically they're gonna tell you they're gonna give most of, most of the time they're gonna give you a number. So they give you six choices. They're gonna give you pick three or four. You know, they tell you, tell you to pick, you know, pick um, uh, two choices, going to be five, five options. So they never make it half and half. So then, then, then they're going to tell you, give you six and tell you to pick three, because then you can't eliminate half, the, half you know, 50% of it. They're going to add that additional question to throw, to throw a wrench in your, in, your, in your brain right there. All right. So in here, we have six, six choices, and that's you three. So you typically are not going to see that anymore. So if they give you, if they give you um, six, they're gonna tell you to pick four right answers, not three. So this in the old in the old test, you know, this was the, the the way, but now they changed it. So like I said, they never just cut it in half for you, which makes it more difficult. All right. So which of the following should be included in the written contract for architectural services? Right. So it's in your contract, you know, the A, the the B one hundred one and the A two hundred one, the general conditions, right? Change the truth to apply. So what should you put in there? So I'm going to tell you what the answers are because just for lack of time. So, wait, and then, uh, so the answer should be C, discretion or reimbursable expenses, E, insurance requirements, and F, additional services that might be provided by the architect, right? So as I said, programming services is not part of your basic services, not traditionally, right? So that's, that would be an additional thing you would have to do. And then A, meets and methods up to be used in construction. You're an architect, you don't do that. That's the contractor, right? So I'm, I'm talking about the, the, wrong, the, the, the wrong answers here. So meets and methods, 
that's not that's not your thing. That's a contractor. That's his or her responsibility. And then D, name of general contractor again. After you do, you're gonna do bidding for that. So basically, you can just eliminate. You can get the right answers just by eliminating the wrong ones here. The ones that are obvious, right? So that's one way you can do it. Just look at the answer, look at the the, uh, the choices, and just just try to eliminate the ones that are just obviously wrong. You know, so you know, meet some mentors. You know, architects we don't do that. Programming services, you know, that's a that's not a basic service. So it's not going to be included in the in the in the contract unless you add it. But here we're not adding it, and then we're not naming the con the, the, the contractor in the contracts. We're not we're not doing that. We do that in the bidding. So that's that's how we came up with uh, with uh, with C E and, and F, which could are kind of like you, you probably wouldn't be thinking about too much, but this actually are in there. All right, any questions on that one? All right, so just eliminate by process of elimination, right? So that's how you get the right answer. Sometimes that's the only way to do it. <laughs> All right, the last one right here, um, T uh, 10, which of the following consultant engineers typically consumes the greatest percentage of project fees on school projects? And I, I'm not gonna say school projects, I'm gonna say on most projects, right? So which of the consultants you're gonna have to pay, you know, pay, uh, it's gonna, you know, actually in some cases charge more than you, you know, uh, civil, electrical, mechanical, and structural. And the answer is mechanical. Mechanical is, is always the, the highest consultant that you will have. You know, electrical and mechanical are pretty high. Uh, structure, I would say in order would be probably mechanical, um, uh, electrical and structural and civil. Uh, but you can check me on that. I'm not sure, but I think I know mechanical and mechanical and electrical typically charge uh, because they, uh, you know, the, just the this mechanical is the scope of the work that they do. It just takes them longer. They have to check more, uh, more um, regulatory. Uh, they got more regulations on them, so they had to constantly be checking on on different things and just the equipment. The amount of time it takes to pick the equipment and 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 uh and apply it to a project and design the duct work or you know. And when I say mechanical, that also includes plumbing. Right, so that's uh, that's included in there. It just takes it takes it takes a lot more time, and, and therefore they, they charge more. Um, it's not because of the, you know the, it's not because in, in I, it's not because to, um, it could be because it just charge more per hour, but I know it takes longer. Um, so, any questions on that one? All right, so that's all the questions. So again, we uh, here from some of the references that you should definitely use in this test, right, on the first exam. So. The AIA contract documents, like, like, like Brian mentioned, right? The B101, right? So, and the, you got the um, the contract documents and those are all available uh, for you for free. Uh, so you can study, you know, you go to the AIA website uh, and, they, and, they, and, they, and, they, and they can give you, or you can find them online. Uh, you know, obviously they're just copies. You're not, you're not uh, typically when you buy them, you can customize them for your own projects, but this is just general information, right? So C401 is the, the one between the architect and the consultant, right? So you wanna know about that. And B101 is between the owner and the architect, right? The, a, the A201 is the general conditions, but that's between the contract, the contractor, you and the owner. But here they just want you to just focus between you and the owner. So B101, so you should definitely study those two because C401 tells you, you know, the, the between you hiring consultants, and then you're dealing with the owner, right? That's very important. So study the study that that those uh, as fun as they are. Oh, there's plenty of videos on YouTube that kind of break those down, so you don't have to go there and read them. I mean, unless you like reading that stuff, which is kind of like watching paint dry. You know, if you like reading contracts, go ahead and read them. And if you target, me, but you you can go to there's plenty of YouTube channels that kind of break it down per section and kind of explain what each section means. And I I think that's I'm a visual learner. So I think I will get more of that than just reading, sitting there and reading those contracts for a couple of hours. Because you might not, you know, I've done that before. And it's kind of like, oh, my goodness, I, 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 I can't, you know, I had to go back and watch those videos to kind of understand exactly what they're saying. And then, again, the, uh, this book right here, the Architect Handbook of Professional Practice, you definitely have to read this book. You know, definitely. I mean, these other ones are important, but this one right here is, is the one that you that you want to that you want to study. Right. And. um. This is what, what that book looks like. So if you don't have a copy, you know, you can, I would suggest that you get a copy or you can borrow a copy from somebody from someone. Um, you know, so and then you know, you had the code of ethics in there, professional conduct. Oh, that's about given by the AIA. So like I said, this book, and actually I think I have a breakdown of the actual, no, I don't have a breakdown of the chapters. I thought I had a breakdown of the chapters in here. I don't. 
I'll break down some chapters that you can probably look at. I, that must have been on, hold on one second. Because the way I had a breakdown of it, I thought it was on this one. I actually had a breakdown of the which chapters you should study, but I guess I don't have it anymore. Huh. If I find out, I, I, I email it to you. But there's somebody did a breakdown of which chapters relate to the PCM exam, the way you don't have to read the entire book and save yourself some time. Uh, I thought I had it in, the, in this presentation, but I, I guess I don't. But again, so this book. Yeah, so it tells you which chapters are more relatable to, to this. So you don't have to read the entire book. So it, it says you should study chapter two, three. I'm just throwing chapters three, five, six, seven, and, and 10. And read those I, chapters. I and, yeah, go I'll ahead. Write it on the, I, don't, I will write that. I have a breakdown, so I'll write that on the, oh, the chat. Okay. All right, great, great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for doing it. I had it. I, I had it must have been my other presentation. So yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, do that. If you can, the way but I can, if you have that book, you can, you can, uh, you can, uh, uh, you can look at it. Um, all right. So, and then again, AIA contract documents this is what they look like. So these are the, the, the other ones, you know, the, the, so like I said, the B101, you know, is the one you want to, you want to look this one right here, B101 and C41 are the ones that sit deal with you and the owner and you and the, um, and the, and your consultants. And these uh, these guys right here are third party, um, you know, resources, you know, that I personally used when I was going through this uh, this struggle of taking these exams. Uh, you know, Amber Book is good. If you're a visual learner, you know, uh, gentleman from Virginia Tech, you know, Michael uh, Michael Ehrman, I think it is. He created that, and you can go there, sign up, and they have a lot of resources for you. And then obviously you got Pluralsight, Black Spectacles is good too. You're an architect. Uh, so these are, you know, subscription resource, you know, you subscribe to these guys and they charge you a monthly fee and you can cancel when you get done. And then you also have uh, books and practice exam, Brightwood PPI. And some people have created the actual, you know, exams, you know, designer hacks just creates exams for you. Designer hacks is really cheap. You know, I think it's like $30. You can keep them forever. And it's a good way to practice. Uh, area exam prep. And these are, this is a practice exam. So you can go in and, those questions tend to be, you know, closely to to um, to what you're gonna see on the exam. Well, at least you can at least study the the material with them. You know, they might not be just like the exam, but I know that the last spectacles, the interface looks exactly like the exam. When you did the practice exam, it looks just like the ARE uh, interface, like the the the, the computer interface. Um, so uh, so I would recommend Hyperfine is really good too. It's cheap. You know, this, uh, this guy, uh, Ben Norkin, is that his name? I think, and he created this thing, you know, the, when I was using it, it was like PDFs that he would send out and you could, you know, study that. And it was it was really good. So I found out very, I, I, I started passing my, I passed my two exams with, with his help. I don't think I would have been able to pass PDD and PPD without without Hopperfine because all the details that he provided were really good, a good way to study. Uh, and Amber Book, those were the two ones that I used the most. These other ones are cheaper, but you know, so you, you, you get what you get. And NCAR has resources as well. You can go to, you can go on their, um, the, the 510 community. They have, you know, people chatting. You cannot talk about the exams themselves, but you can talk about studying and uh, different study materials and stuff like that. Um, that's available that people just talk about the experience on the, on the exam. Uh, and then they have, uh, they have uh, practice exams on there too. So I would suggest you go there. That way you get familiar with the actual exam before you show up and see it for the first time. You've already seen it. You kind of know how it is. So um, they have that there and they have videos and all that stuff is free, right? So, so you can use NCAR for, um, for your resources. Uh, any questions on anything that we went over? Joel, can you go back to your slide that showed all the material? This guy? Can I can I take a screenshot of that one? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, so this I said this guy, this this I uh, I have personally used all of these, you know. Um, so you can see how much I spend on this stuff. Because you, know, you have to pay for all this stuff. Not some of them, I don't think none of them are free, <laughs> except for the anchor stuff. But like some cost more than some cost a few hundred dollars a month, some cost. If you, uh, you know, less than $100 a month, some are one-time fee. 
you know, like this guy right here, the price exam bundle for from Design Hacks, is the cheapest thing you can get. I think it was at that time it was like twenty five bucks. I don't know how much it is now. Um, and you and it was a one time fee. You could use them every time, right? So you, you can go in and practice. And they, they will up, upgrade the test. It's a practice test. They will upgrade it once in a while so you can get new questions. It's just a good way to get your mind into into just studying like what you what you weak on and what you um what you need to uh, w- uh, study more. Um, but it's not as in depth as some of these other like the Black Spectacles or um and the Young Architect. They got here. He has his boot camp. I don't know if you guys have heard of the Young Architect boot camp. I don't know how much that costs. I've never done it, but apparently people have a good rate of passing. Um, all right. So any, um, thank you, Monica, for putting that, um, those chapters in there. Um, so, uh, any, any questions, any other questions? All right, guys. So but I, for putting, for, for putting oh, no problem. No problem. Hopefully, hopefully you guys can join us next month. Um, it's going to be a Tuesday again, probably the second or third Tuesday. I don't know when it is. Uh, uh, join us next week. We're going to be covering um, project management, P- uh, PJM exam, which is very similar to this one. Uh, again, it's the business side of architecture, but that one is more focused, more project focused as opposed to generally business like this one is. Uh, uh, so hopefully you guys can join us then. I'll be sending that information out early next month and and hopefully you can join us. And um, and uh, uh, and I said, tell your friends you know, to join, you know, people who are taking the exam, tell them to come on. You know, I say this stuff is free, it don't cost you anything, and hopefully you get some knowledge of it, you know, that can help you take the, the uh, do better on your exam next now when you take it. I right, haven't said that. Thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of your, uh, your afternoon. Thanks, Joel. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you. Right, thank you. Great job. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Let's start recording this thing.